Okay, we are ready. Yes. All right, good morning to everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Or and Ron for inviting me to come to Israel and that visit this course. It's, it's really a great pleasure, my first ever time in Israel, so this is pretty exciting and interesting. Uh, I realized that I, this is a quite a heavy course, a lot of teaching, and then Or told that also some computer exercises are needed here. So that sounded a lot of work. So I would also like to thank Hencho, who actually came along and, and prepared all the computer exercises for our teaching. That was a big release for me. So this morning I, I will start by telling a little bit of my own research, like a case study, which relates to animal movement and which relates to the kind of the more teaching type material that I will present later. So I'll talk about butterfly movements, population dynamics, and a bit about evolutionary dynamics. Before going to that, a couple of words about my, my background. Uh, like Luca, I'm also not a biologist. I'm an applied mathematician. To start with, I did my PhD at, in the mathematics department in 1998. But since that, I've been in a, in a biology department. <coughs> uh, First I went to University of Helsinki, was a postdoc with Ilkka Hanski, then spent a year in Cambridge with Brian Grenfell, and since that I've been back to, back to Helsinki all the time. <coughs> so I lead a mathematical biology group, which is actually part of Ilkka Hanski's bigger metapopulation research group, which is really a collection of smaller groups like my group. And among the People in my group, maybe half, have their background in, in biology, so they, they do empirical work mainly, and half have, have their background in, in mathematics or statistics or computer science. <coughs> so we, we kind of try to put together theory and, and empirical data. We, we don't work only or actually not work mainly on animal movement, but, but we work on population, biology, uh, population genetics and, and evolutionary dynamics. But animal movement has always been one kind of key issue in, in the group. Uh, I guess you are all, you all think that movement is important because, you know, you came here to this course. But just to motivate a little bit, <coughs> as Ran was emphasizing in his starting lecture, movement really plays a central role in ecology. And this is, this is familiar to you, I guess, that all organisms, all organisms move, but this is not clear even to all biologists. They somehow, sometimes oppose this statement, like trees wouldn't move, but as Ran explained, of course, all organisms, they need to move. And especially if you work with spatial ecology, understanding movement is central because movement is really the process which brings the spatial aspect to population dynamics. The animals are where they are, or plants, fungi, whatever you look at, because somehow they get, get to move there. And <coughs> on top of uh, fundamental research, also applied issues such as monitoring, managing, conserving populations, they often require an understanding of movement. For example, habitats are fragmenting, fragmenting so one concern is whether the organisms can move between the fragments. Climate is changing. Can the organisms move to the areas where climate will be suitable for them in the future? <coughs> in this course, we will talk quite a bit about modeling. So I just wanted to make a cartoon of the kind of approaches that you can take to, to ecological modeling. So <coughs> here on the left hand side we have like the underlying mechanisms and on the right hand side we have the observed or predicted patterns. Uh, so mathematical modeling is kind of the arrow from left to right where what you do is to make assumptions on the underlying mechanisms 
and then you are interested in what are the consequences of those assumptions, what kind of patterns they lead to. So this is the kind of modeling where you, let's say, you write a simulation program, you make assumptions about the processes and about the parameter values, then you run the simulation and you see what kind of patterns emerge. Okay? So you are in interested in the causal relationships at the kind of the general level. You are not necessarily relating the study to data at, at, at any way. Or then, instead of writing a simulation program, you, you might write, write a mathematical model, for example, a differential equation model, and then analyze what that model gives out. For example, what's the stability of the equilibria or something like that. But then the inverse problem <coughs> is such that you observe some patterns, let's say, in the nature, and then you are asking what are the mechanisms that, that produce that pattern. Okay, this is something that we often address with statistical modeling. You, you fit the regression line asking whether some variable x influences variable y. And here the aim is to find out factors that, that shape empirical data. And this inverse, appro inverse direction, inverse problem, that's much harder to tackle than the forward problem because <coughs> often you can produce the same pattern with many different kinds of mechanisms. So kind of mathematically it's not a well-posed problem, there's not a, just a single solution. Whereas this link from left to right, this is more clear-cut. You just make the assumptions and then you predict what happens. So if you read the kind of the mathematical biology literature, then you often see this kind of link from left to right. But if you read the statistical literature, then you see the other link. But nowadays, of course, it is quite common to try to combine these approaches. And in this, these lectures, I will talk quite much about state space modeling. And this is one way to put these two approaches together. Yeah, as, as Luca said, if, if you have any questions while I'll talk, just interrupt me and, and ask questions. Uh, another uh, term for these two types is uh, mechanistic models for the upper part and phenomenological models for the. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That that in the upper part we often <coughs> apply models which are mechanistic in the sense that I mean it's, it's really difficult to say what is really a mechanistic model because you can al always go like one level down to to see what's the mechanism. <coughs> But it's right that in, in this approach, in the statistical models, we also apply like a linear model and there is no kind of good reason to assume that the link is linear. It's just a convenient assumption. <coughs> okay, so this case study is about butterfly movements in heterogeneous space. So we look at that butterfly flying on top of a landscape which might consist of meadows, <coughs> forests, maybe cultivated fields. And we are interested in, let's say, predicting where it's going to fly. <coughs> Before I, I really start with the movement part, I'll, I would like to motivate this study a little bit. And as I said, movement, <coughs> the ability to understand movement is really central if we are going to understand spatial population dynamics. So <coughs> this is a <coughs> study system which Ilkka Hanski I said who was my postdoc advisor and with whom I'm still in the same, same group. A, a study system that he has been studying over the past 20 years. This is the metapopulation of the Glanville free tillary butterfly. So in the map you see the Åland Islands, a set of islands between Finland and Sweden, uh, <coughs> where you have a network of habitat patches for this butterfly. So all the small dots in the map they are habitat patches, which are meadows, which have the host plant that the butterfly needs at the larval stage. The patches are really tiny, so in this map they, are, they look bigger than they are. I mean, even a one hectare patch is, is one of the biggest ones in this system. And we think that this system is a nice model system of spatial population dynamics. <coughs> uh, if you look at the system at any given year, you will see that some of the habitat patches are empty and some are occupied. So in this map, these gray dots were the patches which were empty in the year 2007 and the green ones were occupied. In this case, an occupied patch means that there is at least a single butterfly in the patch. A uh, little bit about the life history of this butterfly. 
they they fly around in in uh, June for a couple of weeks. Then they lay eggs in 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 clusters like 100 eggs into one host plant. Then the larvae emerge and they 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 go together. So it's a larval group. They eat the host plant. They grow. And what you monitor in the autumn are these larval groups. They are quite easy to see. So occupancy means that there is at least one larval group in the patch. So you have a local population. Can you say again what distinguishes the patches? What is called a patch? What do you oh, in, in this, for this butterfly, it's a specialist for its resource requirements. So it's really easy to see what is like a patch and what is not a patch. So a patch is a meadow which has a specific plant, which is the host plant for the larvae, the plant that the larvae eat. Okay, so it's quite easy to walk around in the landscape and say that this is a patch and this is not a patch. Unlike for many other organisms, for this is, it's quite easy. That's why it has been possible to map all these 4,000 patches in the, in the Roland really Islands. Is this fragmented the area? Yes, it's, it's fragmented because of natural reasons. Okay. So that there is, I mean, a lot of the area is forest. Uh, there is topography, which says kind of limits where you can have these dry meadows and where not, where not. Oh, of course, there is also human-induced fragmentation. You know, there are cultivated fields in places where you could have had meadows, and also the meadows they are partly maintained by, let's say, sheep. Okay, so there is some dynamics in the patch network, but now we can think that it's just a static network. Uh, it's 50 by 70 kilometers. What is approximately the dispersal range of these creatures? Well, I'll, co I'll come to that. I mean, that's the movement part. But let's say one kilometer is a typical dispersal distance. And what makes this system interesting is that it's, it's really a classical metapopulation. The classical metapopulation means that, that you have colonization extinction dynamics at the level of local populations. So, for example, in this case, the, <coughs> the uh, I think the red dots, so those populations that were occupied in 2006 and which are still occupied in 2007, whereas the green dots, so those, so those habitat patches which were empty in 2006, but they are now occupied in 2007. So there was a colonization event. And how can we have colonizations? Well, of course, the only possibility for that, on top of observation error, is that a butterfly uh, leaves one of the occupied patches, it emigrates, then it has this dispersal phase, it's, it's flying in the so-called matrix in the area between the habitat patches, happens to find an empty habitat patch, and then colonizes that by laying eggs there and starting a new population. Yeah, still one word about the life hi history of this butterfly. They tend to mate directly after they emerge. So the males emerge earlier than the females. And then they, when the females emerge, they tend to mate pretty soon so that they mate in their natal patch. So it's enough that just a female migrates. You don't need to have a female and a male migrating to start a new population. They do hill topping? Uh, they don't, they don't. The, the topography here is, is, is rather flat, yeah. So, colonizations couldn't happen without movements, okay? If you look at the, the patterns of these colonizations, <coughs> like, let's take one of the empty patches this year and ask that what's the probability that that particular patch will be colonized the next year. We see this kind of a quite strong influence of connectivity. So the probability that the patch will become colonized is higher if this focal patch is connected to the neighboring patches. Okay? Which means in practice that it's surrounded by other patches which have a, already a population. You can quantify connectivity in many ways. It's, it's not really important how it's quantified here. But it's in this example it's just a sum of all other patches that you have in the neighborhood. Then you weight somehow the distance to the neighboring patches. And then you might weight this expression by the areas of the kind of the source patches and of the target patch. I mean, the, 
the area of the source bats matters because a large bat has a large population typically so they have like more migrants that might colonize the uh, target patch. But there is, there is also an opposing force so that if you are in a large patch then you are less likely to leave. So the kind of the per capita emigration might be lower. And then the area of the focal patch I that also plays a role because bigger patches they are easier to find and maybe there are more resources so they might be easier to colonize. Then these colonizations, <coughs> they are compensated by local extinctions. <coughs> so each local population in the system is, is prone to extinction. And this extinction probability quite steeply decreases with the area of the patch. Again, because area is a good proxy of local population size. <coughs> so small population have a high extinction risk already because of just demographic stochasticity. They also have a higher extinction risk because of environmental stochasticity. Well, how, how many of you actually know what, what demographic and environmental stochasticity, what they mean? Hands up if you know what they mean. Okay, you, you tell. So we assume that uh, every given population has some uh, stochastic uh, chances to be extinct without any obvious uh, interference or uh, distur disturbance. Uh, and environmental stochasticity is the same patch in a given year could be less suitable just because, I don't know, the host plant didn't bloom in that year. So even if you do not change anything in space but look on the same site at time, it could be less or more suitable. Yeah, exactly. So demographic stochasticity means that the envi environment is kind of constant and there is just, you know, random variation in births and deaths. Like let's say that on average the species produces 2.3 offspring, okay, but it never produces exactly 2.3 offspring. It produces 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and by chance it might produce 0, okay. Whereas environmental stochasticity, in this case, the, the most relevant variation is variation in, in weather conditions. If there is a really dry year, like hot summer, well, we don't have hot summers by your standards, but if there is a hot summer by our standards, <coughs> then the host plants, they may dry and die. So there is nothing for the larvae to eat, and that might increase the extinction risk. Then there are other things like alley effect, basically meaning that uh, the per capita growth rate might be low at, at very low population densities. For example, if you end up having only single individual in the local patch, that has to be a male or a female, then it cannot continue. Or you may have, you, there's some evidence of a so-called demographic rescue effect. This is something that relates to movement. It means that uh, if, if you just look at this local population and the extinction risk of that, it's influenced on what are the occupancy states of the neighboring patches. Because it might be that this would have gone extinct unless somebody came from the neighboring patches and kind of rescued the population. Then there are genetic things like inbreeding, depression and genetic rescue effect, parasitism and so on, which also influence the extinction risk, but they don't really relate to movement, so let's not talk about those too much here. <coughs> if we put these two things together, colonizations and extinctions, <coughs> so we now know that colonization depends on connectivity, which depends on, you know, how many patches you have in, in the surroundings. We know that colonization and extinction, they both depend on patch area, so that bigger patches are kind of better. If we put these together, let's say in a simple population dynamic model. Such a model will predict us that the butterfly can persist in the long term only in situations where you have like a high density of habitat patch networks. Okay? You can summarize the density of the habitat patch network, like the amount, quantity and connectivity, connectivity of a habitat with a single variable which I have put to the x-axis. This is something that we call the metapopulation capacity of the network. <coughs> so it, it is high for this kind of networks which have many habitat patches, large habitat patches and, and 
patchy is close to each other and it's low in this kind of situations where the network is locally more sparse. Okay? And what the model predicts <coughs> with this kind of this line here which hits zero comes to zero in this part of the graph and what you also see in the, in the empirical data which are the black dots is that the, there is an, some evidence for an extinction threshold. So in this kind of poor networks the butterfly simply can't persist. So if you go to survey this kind of a network you will find that it's, it's not present in any of the habitat patches. Whereas in those kind of good networks the butterfly is present with some, at some, of some fraction of the, of the habitat patches. So in this graph each dot represents one network of patches, not just a single patch. And this is a little bit non-trivial. You know, also in these cases you have perfectly suitable habitat patches. They have the host plants, they have all the resources that the butterfly needs, but, but the system is just too fragmented so that the colonizations are not enough to compensate for the extinctions. And that's why the population goes eventually extinct. <coughs> okay, and movement plays a central part of this story because as said, all the colonizations, they are due to movements. So let's next talk about movements of, of butterflies. <coughs> uh, Can you go back? for the previous graph. So here, it, wouldn't it be very important the way you weight the different components of your x-axis? Like if the amount will be, I don't know, weighted three times more, so it might change, actually shift significantly the way you see the x-axis. So it's pretty yeah. sensitive to the way you say you weight the connectivity versus the quality and the quantity. Yeah, exactly. That's a very relevant question of <coughs> how, how do you weight these things. So the way we kind of weighted them is to, is to look like <coughs> how, let's say, extinction scales with patch area, how colonization scales with these different things. Then you write down a population dynamic model. Actually, in this case, just a system of differential equations. And then you ask that, <coughs> given that model, what is the threshold for persistence? Okay. This becomes a little bit mathematical, but technically then the condition is that, uh, that the leading eigenvalue of a, of a given matrix is uh, positive. I mean, it's just a stability analysis of, of that system of differential equations. So what we put to the x-axis here is that leading eigenvalue. So it's kind of a measure that the theory predicts that, you know, this is a good proxy for extinction threshold. So another approach would be like, this is a bit more mechanistic than the kind of the more statistical approach where you would just, you know, compute the amount and quality and connectivity separately and then you somehow weight them to sum them up. Okay, so this is a bit more based on, on, on some theory. Is there a problem with the collinearity between the variables? Sorry? Collinearity between. If uh, the variables affect each other, yeah, that would be a problem in a statistical analysis where you would try to say that what's the influence of uh, amount per se versus connectivity per se. Yeah, but that's, I mean, which is a relevant question, but which is something that we don't try to do here. A actually, in this system, there's so much data. I mean, there are 4,000 habitat patches and the system has been monitored for like 20 years. So there is a huge amount of data on colonizations and local extinctions, so we, we can separate them in this case. Okay, so if you think about creatures such as butterflies, uh, unfortunately we cannot put a GPS collard around their neck and even the devices are getting smaller and smaller as Rand was telling us. It's not realistic that in the, in the next year or year after that we are able to do that. So still a lot of the research in this area is based on kind of more old-fashioned methods such as mark recapture. I guess you all know what is mark recapture, but just to illustrate, this is a case study of not, not the Glanville free tillery butterfly, but this is the clouded Apollo butterfly. <coughs> uh, here you see a map of a heterogeneous landscape. The red areas are the habitat patches for this butterfly, again having the host plant for, for, for its larvae. 
and then the rest is split to some forests, cultivated fields. <coughs> what the researchers do is to, is to walk uh, in this area, they capture all butterflies they, they can capture, they write the number to the wings, and they release the butterfly, and if you capture the same butterfly later again, then you have a capture-recapture event, and those are illustrated by the lines in this map. So every line is a capture-recapture event of, of a given butterfly. Typically you get the same butterfly back, uh, mostly zero times, you don't see it again. Quite often once, sometimes twice, three times is a high number already. So this is kind of very sparse data if you compare to, let's say, GPS data. You, you can also use technology to, to track the paths, movement paths of, of butterflies. This is an example of the Glanville free tillary butterfly, the Hanskis butterfly, uh, where we used harmonic radar. <coughs> so you see a passive transponder which is attached to the butterfly. Uh, it's, it's very light. Actually the weight of the transponder is less than what the butterfly eats in one go if it's feeding nectar. So it can fly very nicely also with the transponder. This is the radar, so it's turning around once in every three seconds. And this lower, bigger disk is sending out a signal, which is modified by the transponder. And then the smaller disk is, is reading that back. So the radar is, is here in the, in the origin. <coughs> it can see up to about 500 meters. But the restriction is that it only works in a really flat area. So basically you do this in a soccer field if you want the best coverage. We did this in a, in a kind of a semi-natural uh, heatland in, in UK. But what you get is a, is a pretty accurately, accurate uh, track of the butterfly's movements. The position error is not too bad, it's like a couple of meters. You get the direction for each reading, you get the direction and the distance? Yeah, exactly. And like sometimes you see these kind of long lines here, it doesn't mean that it was flying like crazy, it means that there is some missing data because the coverage is, is not perfect. Very sensitive to trees and buildings, or only cover? It is very sensitive to trees and buildings. It should be like an open area and flat area. Yeah, and this is of course very specific piece of device. I mean, unlike like with GPS data, everybody is using GPS and the amount of data is exploding. But with this case, there is basically one piece of equipment in the world. So if you want to use this, you you have to contact people in the in, in Rothamsters research, like Alan Smith, who kind of made this radar by themselves. I mean, starting from a, some radar from a ship, and they kind of cu customized it for this purpose. So this will not be like, I, I don't think it will ever be like a major, you know, tool available for everybody. So it's more like a curiosity. Oh, that's a relevant point. I forgot to say that the, another negative thing with this piece of device is that, that <coughs> all the transponders are identical. You cannot distinguish individuals, for which reason we had to release uh, only five butterflies at the time. I mean, we are, we are not looking at the natural population here. We have lab raised individuals which we brought here. We released them at something like five in different places of the area at the same time. They were indi individually marked by writing a number to the wing so the guys were sitting in the, in the car in the middle where they monitored like who is moving where and whenever the paths came too close to each other we went to check where, which butterfly is which. Okay, so the, you cannot distinguish individuals automatically. This is a great uh, negative side of, of this technology because you cannot do like population studies, you cannot study how the individuals interact. So, if we think of these two approaches, and if I go a little bit back to the kind of the approaches to ecological modeling that I started with, <coughs> we can think that this harmonic radar exercise tells us something directly on the, on the mechanisms of movement, something like flight speed, 
directional persistence, behavior at edges, and so on. Oh, coming back to behavior at edges, let me just point out that something that we observed is that this gray line here, that's the, that's the edge between the heathland and the forest. So we saw that a lot of butterflies were following the edge. This is very typical to butterfly, this kind of edge following. So the radar experiment tells something directly about these kind of mechanisms, whereas marker capture data tells us about the patterns that, that we were interested about. Like how do the individuals distribute themselves at the population level in this kind of a mosaic of habitat types. Well, run point, I mean we discussed a bit of what is a mechanistic model. You could say that this is not the mechanism, this flight speed. You could draw another mechanism here which would relate to, you know, like the energetic constraints and that metabolism and so on. But, but if, if this is the pattern we are interested about, then like flight speed is one mechanism that produces that pattern. Okay, uh, analysis of this kind of data is, is actually quite tricky. I mean, this is one of the most common data types that you have in, in movement ecology still, this capture recapture data. But as I said, it's, it's not really easy to analyze that kind of data. What you often want to know is, is something like, you know, a very basic question. What's the movement rate of your organism? H how do you figure it out from, from, from this kind of data? I'm not going to define now precisely what is the movement rate, it's a little bit ill-posed concept, but basically like how fast they are moving. The problem here is that <coughs> this kind of spatial capture recapture data or mark recapture data doesn't depend only on the properties of the species. Like you can think that the movement rate would be a property of the species. But it also depends on the structure of the landscape and the it depends on the design of the study. So if you just plot something like, like the distribution of the observed movement distances, as is done here, I would claim that this tells next to nothing about the property of the species. Because you don't have the time. Time lag between consecutive observations. Yeah, yeah, that's one good point that if you just plot this, do not have the, uh, the time, time step like how, uh, as you said, uh, so, first the structure of the landscape, like in this case you can see already by your eye that, <coughs> that we have some corridors in the landscape. Basically this area, which is like a riverside meadows, that the butterflies are following. <coughs> and then about the design of the study, where you sample and how often you sample very much influences on what you see. I mean, to make this clear, let's assume that you just sample at two places which are one kilometer apart. Everything that you can see here is a peak in zero. You got an observation in the same place where you released the individual and another peak at one kilometer because that's the only distance that you are trying to sample. Okay, and as Moore said, if you sample more frequently, then you are likely to see shorter distances between the observations, if you sample less frequently, then you are more likely to see like long distances between two captures. Uh, and people have developed kind of statistical methods to correct for these kind of artifacts, but that's really difficult to do. I think they all just lead to further problems that they might, I mean they solve one problem, but then you made up having another other problem. Uh, just to illustrate, <coughs> there was a kind of a meta-analysis paper which looked at all capture-recapture studies that were done in for the same species of butterfly. All of those papers, they reported what is the mean dispersal distance of that butterfly. And what this meta-analysis showed was that this, that mean dispersal distance was directly proportional to the, to the size of the study area they used. Okay, so the bigger study area you choose, the bigger was the mean dispersal distance that you reported. So, the problem here is that how, how do you disentangle these three from each other? Okay, and one way of doing that <coughs> is to use 
the modeling approach, something that you could call a Bayesian state space approach, about which you will hear much more in the in the lectures and, and you will also in the exercises learn to fit these kind of models yourself. <coughs> so the idea here is that you specify, you, you kind of separate the, the movement process from the observation process. Okay? You define a movement model. In this case it will be a diffusion, habitat selection, mortality model. I'll describe that in more detail later. But you anyway you specify your movement model. It describes what you assume about the biology, kind of independently of the observation process. And then you define your observation model, which is describing the observation process. In this case, this process of doing capture recapture. It might also have some parameters, like in this case, it will have the capture probability. And the idea is that the, the data that you see is kind of jointly influenced by these two models. Okay? I, I will do this in a Bayesian context, so I, I need to define priors for, for my parameters, both for the movement model and for the observation model. I'll, I'll tell more about that later, if, if you don't know what is a prior. And then the statistical inference, the estimation is done so that you fit both, the, both model, models simultaneously to data. And that's the way to kind of separate these three factors. <coughs> now the properties of the species as well as the structure of the landscape, they are in my movement model, whereas the design of the study, that's in the observation model. <coughs> this approach here, this is of course like really a general framework for, for modeling ecological data. It's not restricted to movement models. You could put, put here any process model for some ecological process. Doesn't need to be ecological, any, any dynamic process. In the later kind of lectures, I, I'll talk a bit more about the technical details of, of how you do it. Here are just some papers where I explain how you do it specifically for, for these kind of case studies. So, what we need is a movement model. In this case, we need a movement model for heterogeneous space. As the, the whole motivation of doing this study is to ask how the structure of the landscape influences movements. Okay? So we want to model, specify a movement model <coughs> which captures somehow the heterogeneity of the landscape. And, and one way of doing that is to assume that the landscape consists of a finite number of habitat types, like I've done in this case. The case there are like four habitat types. And <coughs> what I do here is, is to assume that the, the rate of movement, which is in this case the diffusion uh, coefficient of movement, it might be different in different habitat types. But this is actually not enough for, for many species, many specialist species like butterflies like many butterflies, because they also do something at the edges between those habitat types. So this is what Cheryl Schultz and Elizabeth Crone, what they called edge-mediated behavior, which is really habitat selection that takes place at the boundaries between the different habitat types. So for this uh, prairie butterfly that Cheryl and Elizabeth were studying, this uh, part with the lupines, this is the habitat patch, this is the so-called matrix. <coughs> this butterfly flew out from the habitat patch and if you would apply a, let's say, correlated random walk, then the, the butterfly would have a tendency to continue to this direction it was already moving, okay? But then this arrow here relates to edge-mediated behavior, habitat selection. The butterfly noticed that I went out from the habitat patch that I prefer to something else, so it might decide to, to turn back. <coughs> so that, that's this arrow here. And so one way to model kind of the uh, fact that you have these kind of two forces pulling you to different directions is to take an average so that the expected direction of the next movement would be, would be the arrow pointing up. And maybe this is the realized direction. There is some stochasticity around the expectation. Sorry, I have another question. 
if the butterfly and they do have a detection range, they can see, they don't have to cross the border and see, okay, I am in the wrong habitat. They can see, oh, the forest is over there. So I think we'll get something much more similar to the lines you showed that they move within the habitat, but along the edge, because they can make the same decision, the same uh, calculation, just within the habitat before they leave, within the, not the matrix, but the suitable habitat. Yeah, yeah, the idea here is that you have, that the edge has some finite uh, width, which is basically, let's say, the detection radius of, of the butterfly. And habitat selection takes part within this edge, okay? So if you are like in the core area of the meadow, you don't see the edge, then you are just doing some random walk. If you are in the core area of the matrix, that's the same, you do your random walk, but maybe different parameters. But if you are in the edge, then you have this bias. Okay. So the width of the edge is actually the perceptual range of the animal. For example, it can. I mean, that's a good, good proxy for it. I, I'll talk in the lectures. I'll talk much more in, in more detail about this habitat selection uh, behavior. So this is a simple model <coughs> for butterfly movement in heterogeneous space. Random walk, which we can approximate by diffusion, as I will explain in more detail in the lectures. Uh, within each habitat type, and then habitat selection at the edges between the habitat types. You can write down this model mathematically as, with, as a kind of a partial differential equation. <coughs> Just for those of you who, who know about mathematics, I wrote it down there. I will tell a little bit about that in the, in the lectures, but I, I'm not going to go too deep into the, in the mathematics. So. This is now the movement part that we, we need in the state space framework. In this case, I simplified the landscape to three habitat types. So we end up with the model to a model with six parameters. So we have one diffusion coefficient for every habitat type. That's like how fast does the butterfly move in meadows, cultivated fields, forests. Uh, then we have two parameters for habitat selection. And this is because you can think of habitat selection like the preference of the individual to a given habitat type, okay? And these are relative numbers. It's like how much it prefers meadows compared to forests, okay? So you can scale one of these to one because they are relative values. That's why we have only two parameters, although we have three habitat types. And then, you know, these kind of butterflies, they, they live only something like two weeks typically when they are adults. So you have to account for mortality in your model. In this case, I was assuming that mortality is constant everywhere, just to simplify. So I have only one mortality parameter. Uh, previously, you, you said that the motivation for this uh, uh, Bayesian approach is uh, to separate the species attributes from the landscape attributes. But this parameter seems to be the interaction. Yeah. Well, the main motivation of these state-based approaches is to separate the, the biological reality from the sampling process. Okay? This biological reality, this movement model. But if it, you go on slide, the previous slide, then, then you still cannot uh, uh, distinguish the properties of the species in the structure. Yeah, so what we are saying that these points one and two, both of them are in the movement model. Yeah. Okay, this is absolutely right. So I will separate later show like how, how you can then kind of separate these from the movement model. Okay, so these two go to the movement model, this goes to the observation model. And later we look at these two separately. Okay, so now we have specified the movement model, right? And next I'll specify the observation model. And in this case, the observation model is, is really simple. So what the biologists do is, 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 I mean, you have different kinds of capture, recapture studies. In this case, they, they actually made a grid on top of the landscape. <coughs> and then they just walk around and they kind of search at, at the time one of these grid cells. So once they are in this grid cell, let's say 25 times 25 meter cell, they capture all butterflies that they can see there, okay? 
So I define the capture probability <coughs> as the conditional probability that if the butterfly number 15, which you have marked before, if it happens to be exactly in this grid cell at the time when they do the search, <coughs> what is the probability that they will actually capture it? Okay. So this capture probability is not one because they might simply miss the butterfly. Maybe they see it, but they can't capture it. Or often you just don't see it. It's hiding somewhere in the vegetation. For butterflies, this kind of capture probability is typically something like 0.4, if you have like experienced people doing the survey. But the key thing here is that also the cases where you don't find the individual, that actually gives you some data, some information. And the reason is that if you search this habitat, this grid cell here, and you don't find one of the focal individuals, then after the search, it's less likely that the individual is here than it was before the search. Okay. It can still be there because maybe you missed it, but it's less likely that now that it's there. And if you are, <coughs> let's say, searching site number one, so this here is site number one, this is, <coughs> this is another site, site number two, so then the probability that the butterfly is here goes down, and of course, the probability that it's somewhere else has to go up. Okay? Also, the probability that the butterfly is dead will go up. And it's a really simple kind of pro probability, elementary probability calculation to see that this is the way to update the capture pro the probability that the butterfly is inside one after the search, it goes a bit down, and this is how much it goes up in the other places. <coughs> no, this is not because it flies away. I mean, the, of course, the realization is that the butterfly is always in one location. Okay, so when I see that, uh, when I talk about the probability that the butterfly is somewhere, that's like our knowledge about the location, which has uncertainty. Okay, so before we did this search, let's say that we, we would know how the butterflies behave. We know where it was released. We would have some a priori probability that it should be here at that time. I will illustrate this soon in more detail. But the, so that, let's say that before we go there, our guess would be that it's there with 5% probability. Okay? But after you have been there, if you see the butterfly there, then you know it that with 100% probability it is there. But it, if you don't see it, then the probability is not anymore 5%, it's maybe 2%. Because you you know you tried to see it, you didn't find it. Okay, then it's less likely that it's there. This is the probability that it was there, but we didn't see. P P is the capture probability, so it's the probability that we will see it if it's there. So one minus P is the probability that we don't see it even if it's there. And what I have here, this X, is the probability that the individual is the, is in the site before we do the search. And this expression is the probability that it's still there after we did the search, even though we didn't see it. So it is there, but we missed it. Yeah, it's there, but we missed it. Exactly, yeah. What is the one minus px? Uh, well, it's just one minus the capture probability times the probability it was there before. Why do you like it? Well, this is something that you it comes out from a kind of an elementary probability calculation. If you want, we can do it later, but I mean, you, w once you see it, it's not obvious that why should it look like that. But if you write a couple of lines on paper, you will see that this is what, how it should be. Or you can look at this, this paper, 2004 in ecology, where I do the calculation. So now we have done, defined both models and the rest is just like a technical exercise. How do you fit them to data? We have done everything interesting, like everything biologically interesting. The rest is the technical exercise, computations of likelihood doing MCMC sampling that we will talk about more later. I'll just illustrate how it happens in this case. We actually have to solve the diffusion model numerically because it's a heterogeneous landscape. We cannot apply some analytical solutions. So here you see a triangulation of the landscape. I have split it to small triangles so that every triangle consists just of one habitat type. 
You, you can also see the sampl sampling grid here because I want one triangle to be only within one sampling site. <coughs> then I can apply uh, something called FEM. This is the finite element method. It's just one numerical method that you can apply to to solve partial differential equations. For example, you can do this in, in MATLAB. Sorry, also, why triangular? Uh, maybe you said, why do you want triangular? Rather than a grid. No, I mean, this triangular. Yeah. That you're solving the fusion equation under a triangular lattice. Yes. So why, why did you choose triangular? Uh, compared to what? Like a, like a rectangle. Rectangular or, or yeah? Well, triangular is, is handy because, you know, in this case, like you classify the landscape using polygons like this, okay? So you, you can approximate this with a triangle, like exactly. If you use a rectangle, you would end up doing something like this, okay? And also, triangles are the default way of working with finite element method that leads to simplest inference there, okay? But you can use others as well. This is just easy and kind of natural. It's the simplest you can you can choose. <coughs> so this is how the solution to that model looks like. So what I'm illustrating here is the solution to this numerical solution to this partial differential equation given some parameter values that are realistic for this species of butterfly. So I'm I'm releasing the butterfly here. So initially in the beginning of this simulation like, like now, you only see red color in that area. So which means that you know certainly that the butterfly is there because you just released it there. So mathematically you can you start from a Dirac delta distribution which is put to that location. And then <coughs> what happens after that in the course of the time is that you see the time evolution of the probability density. So this is the probability, the color shows the probability density of the individual's location. The darker red color, the more likely it is that the butterfly is in that location at that time. What is the time scale in the field? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't put the time here, but this is over two weeks. It's basically over the lifetime of, of an individual. And so what you see is kind of that the uncertainty about the location is, is increasing because the red color is spreading. Of course, you know, you release it there. If you don't go back and look, if you go there after a week, the butterfly can be kind of anywhere. And this color is showing what's the distribution of where it is likely to be. What, what you see is this kind of sharp edges. So it's not only distance that matters, but also the structure of the landscape plays a role. So you are much li more likely to see the butterfly here in the habitat patch than here in the cultivated field next to the patch. And this is because we had the edge-mediated behavior in the model. It's kind of keeping the individuals in the preferred habitat patches. What is the scale of this? this scale? Uh, it's something like a kilometer times a kilometer. No, a couple of kilometers times a couple of kilometers. So they enter the forest quite, uh, quite a lot in the initial phase. You see next uh, round here. They enter... Yeah, yeah well, well I, I didn't put the scale here. So, you know, this is like maybe a log scale plot. I will have like numbers later in more quantity. The, the index is missing here. But I mean, they, they can enter the forest. Yeah, especially these kind of semi-open areas. Otherwise, they couldn't move between these habitat patches. They have to cross somehow. Okay. Sorry. Why do they enter the forest more at the initial stage than at the later stages? Uh, well, initially, you know, the, the butterfly was here and it's just next to a forest. And <coughs> so it, it's it's quite likely that, you know, if you go to that forest like an hour later, that you might see the butterfly there. Okay, but if you go to that forest, let's say a week later, you don't anymore see the butterfly because it's likely that it has moved like far away. So, so, so it doesn't mo move to the nearby forest like with a higher likelihood in, initially than later. That is always the same, like the strength of edge behavior is always the same. But it's only that later there are so many other possibilities that the butterfly might be anywhere else. That's why, why the color is getting lighter here.
The, the probability is that the, the butterfly initiated in the space will reach each of these locations. It's not that to the one over one kilometer away will no. reach the nearby side, it's from the origin. Yeah. But what are the parameters that you entered the model? Huh? What are the parameters? Well, the parameters are the parameters that I estimated for the butterfly. I, I, I will show them later. So all the, six, uh, all the six variables? Yeah, all the six variables, yeah. And you change it for a range from zero to... Eight. Sorry? And you change it every simulation. In this simulation, I assume a fixed set of parameters, right, which are something like the maximum likelihood estimates for this butterfly. But when I estimate the parameters, which I'll illustrate next, then I, I'll change them. Okay. So, just one more technical comment. This is the probability density, meaning that it's probability per unit area. So, you can think of that as a kind of a surface. If I integrate over that surface, like kind of sum up the probabilities, th then what I get is, <coughs> initially I get one, because you know it's certain that the butterfly is somewhere. Later I get values which are less than one, because the integral is the probability that the butterfly is still alive. Okay, one minus that integral is the probability that it has died already. Now, to apply statistical inference, I need to be able to calculate the likelihood of the data that I observed. And let's say that I observe that the butterfly is like here at time five, the day five after release. So, so what you have to do is to integrate this probability density over that area, over that, that site where you are searching. Because that gives the probability that it, 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 it is there. Okay? And this is what you contrast to data. But I'll talk about that in more detail later. The end result of doing parameter estimation, which says, as I said, it's kind of it's a big technical step. It takes a lot of effort, but it's kind of biologically boring in the sense that there is nothing biological in there. It's just a technical step. I, it will give you this kind of parameter estimates. I mean, this is just one of the diffusion rates, which I'm illustrating here. This is how fast the butterflies move in, in kind of a dispersal habitat, semi-open forests. I, on a log scale. So small numbers means that the butterflies wouldn't move basically at all. I mean these numbers would be that it moves like on average a, a meter a day. These large values would mean that they move like 100 kilometers a day. So they are like highly unrealistic values. This dashed line is the prior that I assumed. So this is like what I guessed before I saw the data. In this case, I, I'm, because I didn't have re any real prior knowledge, there was no previous study, for example. I didn't have any good prior knowledge. So I'm just saying that, okay, I, I'm pretty certain that they move more than a meter and less than 100 kilometers. So anything is possible, okay. So this is a kind of an uninformative prior. These are the posterior distributions. So they are what you know about the parameter values after you have seen the data. Things like environmental variation and population variation across years would be accounted as noise? Uh, yeah, let, let me answer that after I explain what, what is a posterior, because maybe that's not clear to, to everybody. So, so I, I estimated this separately for males and females, split the data to two uh, slots. And you can think that the peak here, that's like your best estimate of the parameter value. And then the width of this posterior, that tells about the uncertainty about your parameter estimate. Okay? Like in this case, you can say that, you know, this overlaps so little that you can say with high statistical confidence that females move faster than males in this dispersal habitat. We are much more confident about the parameter estimate for males than for me females because males are easier to capture. We have more data on, on males. They are, less low, they are more local, so you have higher chances to recapture them. Yeah, that might be part of the story that they are more local, but actually in this case the spatial uh, design was so extensive that I don't think this is a big issue. It's only that they, because they behave differently, males are easier to capture. Okay. Now, coming back to your question, <coughs> I mean, what we 
what is width of the posterior illustrates you is, is parameter uncertainty. Okay, so it is not uncertainty related to anything else. Like maybe you pointed out that you know in this case the individuals they are not identical. They all move at their own rates. Okay, but you shouldn't think that this is the distribution of the movement rates of those different individuals. That's not the case because we assume in the model that the individuals are identical. They all have the same diffusion rate. Okay. So this is an assumption we make. It might be wrong. Well, we know it's wrong, but still we make it to, to simplify. Yeah, you still need to quantify the tendency to go outside the building area. Sure. I mean, the model has six movement parameters. Oh. I just illustrate one of those just you know, to illustrate. But when you estimate the parameters, you get the estimate for all six parameters. Okay. So females also have greater tendency to move, to move outside. Uh, I don't remember how it's for exactly for this case, this butterfly, but but not not necessarily. It might be that they just have a high movement rate when they got get out. But th then you mentioned the environmental stochasticity. Like if you would repeat the study in in uh, next year, maybe the conditions are different and the butterflies move at a faster rate or slower rate. Again, this. Distribution here doesn't reflect that uncertainty or that variation at all. This is just the parameter value for this year, okay? Because we don't have data on variation. You have to repeat the study in different years to, to see that variation. What's the y-axis in this uh, figure again? Yeah, this is the posterior density. So this is the this is the probability density. Yes. So if you so you can think that this is a histogram like how likely different values are. I'm, well, you know this, but maybe I'll just uh, <coughs> clarify for, for others. It's very impressive that it's so high. Yeah? It's very impressive how high it is. No, on the other hand, the x is not low scale. All right. I was just confused by the values that are much higher than 1. But all right. Yeah, that's because it's not probability. It's probability density. Okay. And if you integrate over this curve, then you get 1. Okay, because it's a probability distribution. It's very centered. Yeah, for ma males, it's, it's very centered, very concentrated, which is exactly the same thing as saying that we have a high confidence of the parameter. So, I mean, you can look at like the 95%. Uh, in Bayesian analysis, you don't say confidence interval, so you say credibility interval. So you can look at like the 95% of this interval, of this distribution, to, to see what's the confidence on the parameter. So, so this prior is what I assumed before I, I saw the data. Okay. This posterior is what you get after you have see, after you have applied all the data. So I, I skip some details because you know this is just like an introductory lecture where I tell more generally about our research. Later I tell more in more detail how do you actually do this. But this the posterior includes all the data. So I have told to the kind of to the model to the software that we wrote. Like, what is the structure of the landscape? This came through this triangulation that I showed. So that's kind of one input parameter. Then the other one is, is a, like an effort matrix telling which of those sites they visited and which day. So it's a spatially explicit capture recapture. And then all the capture recapture data is there. After you squeeze all this data through this MCMC, you get this posterior. The power was the same for females. Sorry? The power was the same for males and females. The, which one? The prior. The, pa the prior. prior. Yeah, the prior was the same for both. Yeah, that's right. Well, these kind of diffusion models are really nice in the, in the sense that they are mathematically well understood. So you have a lot of mathematical tools that you can apply. And let's say that you would be interested in colonization probabilities. Okay, then you need to know something about connectivity. And in 
maybe you know that you know you can connectivity is kind of a vague term. You can talk about structural connectivity, functional connectivity, and so on. This is one example of functional connectivity. What is the probability that the butterfly that is born to some location in this landscape will ever visit, for example, this meadow here? Okay. We would need to know this if we would like to model, let's say, metapopulation dynamics and predict colonizations. <coughs> so because we were using a diffusion model, we can solve this probability directly. So there is some mathematical theorem that tells us how to solve that probability. The solution to that equation looks like this. <coughs> so here the red color tells that if you start from some initial location, like here, what is the probability that you will hit, find these habitat paths before you die? So if you start from very nearby, then that probability is basically one. So dark red means probability one. If you start from here, then the probability is something like one out of thousand. So you are really unlikely to, to go there. Uh, so what I think is interesting here is that the movement probability is uh, they don't just decay with distance because you don't see a you know, symmetric circular pattern here. But the structure of the landscape has a quite a strong influence. Okay? This is because there are some kind of natural dispersal corridors, dispersal barriers in this landscape. Uh, and as I said, with diffusion models you can, like solving this, making this map takes like a, I don't know, fraction of a second, you can solve this 100 times in a second. But if you would do this, let's say, using random walk model, a simulation, it would be really tedious to construct this map. Because let's say that you want to know what's the value if you start from here. Uh, it's something like one out of thousand. So you have to do thousand simulations until the butterfly dies to see if it hits this place on average even one time. And you have to repeat that many enough times to do, get good statistics. And then you have to repeat that for all initial conditions, or initial locations. But with the help of this you know, basic theory for diffusion processes, you can just solve that in, in a fraction of a second for all initial conditions at, at once. But also then the question is how well the diffusion equation fit the, the real observation as opposed to one more. Exactly. I was just going to come to this, that this is like mathematically very nice and very convenient. <coughs> But the real question is that whether this makes any sense biologically. Uh, so, as you know, all models are wrong. And however wrong your model is, you can always fit it to data. You can always find the maximum likelihood estimate. Or you can do your Bayesian inference. You can make predictions like that. But it doesn't mean that they make any sense. And that's why with any modeling approach you should do model validation. You should critically look if your model is, is good enough. This probability density function is integrated over all the initial conditions? No. So when I, when I solved this other simulation, that was about probability density. Okay. This is actually about probability. All right. So this probability is this, integrated this, over all initial conditions? No, no. This is the probability that, you know, if I start from exactly this point here, right. what is the probability that I will ever visit this patch? So you don't need to integrate this solution over space. Actually, it doesn't make any sense to integrate it. It's directly a probability. As you see, these numbers are between 0 and 1. So sometimes I'll talk about probability densities, sometimes probabilities. Uh, mortality doesn't play a role, because I see that it's 1 from a very large uh, area. And I understand the connectivity is higher, but there is a chance of mortality before arriving at the point, no? Yeah. So this is the probability that you will visit this patch before you die, okay? And mortality plays a really big role in this. Because, well, this is like mathematical theory of random walks or diffusion. <coughs> uh, in, if you wouldn't die, if mortality is set to zero, then you will visit that patch with probability one wherever you start, mm -hmm. okay? Because diffusion or random walk, Brownian motion, in 2D, it's, it's so-called neighborhood recurrent. It means that, you know, if you do random walk in this 2D plane here, I specify any area here, I start anywhere I like, 
like there. I just run it for long enough time. I will visit this place with probability 1. Okay, in 2D. In 1D, Brownian motion is like point-wise recurrent, that you will, you don't specify an area, but just a point. Okay, you will go through that. Huh? It's a point, it will take an infinite time. You will turn it one, but it will take an infinite time on average. This area. It becomes a point, it becomes a point. Well, not a point, it has to be a neighborhood, like an epsilon-sized neighborhood. Okay, it's finite, it's finite. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I mean 1D diffusion is like Brownian motion is like recurrent in point wise so that you will go through this point in 2D it's I mean I, I think the term is like uh, locally recurrent or neighborhood yeah, recurrent. But it is one, but it take an I'm just telling you since I learned from the first passage. Exactly. That yeah. It is a point it becomes in the first passage so. Yeah, yeah. So so the this is like Brownian no motion without mortality, like infinite time, okay? I, I, if you do this in 3D, then even this is not true that you would visit the same neighborhood, okay? In, in 3D, diffusion is like transient, you will escape to infinity. But in 2D it's not, and that's why if we wouldn't have mortality at all, then all this map would be completely red. You would always visit that with probability 1. Again, why, the difference between 2D and 3D, why is it different? Uh, well, that's a deep question, like why is it different? <laughs> but like, I mean, how it is different if I first repeat that? So in 2D, you know, I, I draw here any s small area. I start anywhere, like here, or let's say, let's put this point there to Finland, 1,000 kilometers away. If I don't die, if I... confined space, right? No, this is not confined space, infinite space, okay. So with probability one, I will visit this place. Okay, in 2D. But in 3D, like I, 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 I draw a small ball here, and then we start from the corner of the class. So it's not with probability one that this particle would visit this ball ever, I mean, in infinite three dimensional space. And why is that? That's a more deep question. So you pick up a mathematics book and, and look why. <laughs> or then you ask Luca in the break. Yeah, but uh, more axes move. Yeah. So yeah, there are more possibilities where, where you might go. Yeah, but you're saying infinite time. Even at infinite, even at infinite, infinite time, you will not get there? Yeah, that's right. In dimensions greater than two, you don't. That's good. You are not hit by metals. So it's, it's kind of the same thing that, you know, if I, if I draw here random walk or Brownian motion in, in 2D in this plane, okay? In, in infinite blackboard. And then you, you take any area here and then you look what happens is that these lines, they eventually they fill it, fill it completely. Okay, it becomes dense. I mean, sometimes you go like very far away, but you always come back and, and make one line more. Okay. So that was the short answer to the question, does mortality play a role? Yes. <laughs> But then coming, coming to Rand's question that it's, it's nice, but does it make any sense? So let's do some, some model validation exercise. <coughs> and you can do model vali validation in, in many different ways. I'll talk more about that in the lectures. This is what I think is one nice way to do model validation that you try to predict something uh, that, that you, do, you don't just do cross validation with, with the same data you used for fitting the model, but you try to predict something kind of new or Novel. In this case, we took the data from this landscape A, which I showed to you, to fit the model. Uh, and then, with the help of the fitted model, we tried to predict how those same butterflies of the same species would behave in a landscape which is structurally a bit different. Okay, this landscape B. It consists of the same habitat types, so we can make the prediction, but it is structurally a bit different. Uh, what we see here uh, is this, this is just like one statistics of capture recapture study, this distribution of observed uh, movement distances between the captures. These red dots are the real data that we got from this landscape, like real data from a capture recapture study that they did there. And then these black dots with the error bars, 
They show the model prediction with the 95% confidence interval based on the model that was fitted to the data from this landscape A. So you see that the, the fit is, is pretty good. I mean, the, the data points, real data points are always within the confidence intervals and the overall pattern is predicted quite nicely. So the, I think the model does quite a good job. And I think this gives you some confidence that the model is, makes some biological sense, that it's somehow able to separate the structure of the landscape from the movement properties of the, of the species. What happened with the tail? Well, if you look at the tail, like these long distances, uh, so first of all, you should observe that this is a logarithmic scale, okay, and then we have a break here, because you know, you can only observe like zero, one, or greater. So these are all zeros, but that's also in line with the model prediction, because the model prediction, I mean, always says that you can observe zero. Maybe the mean, mean here is like one, so the mean is not huge. It says that you would expect one, but okay, you could very well see zero, as you saw. So, so the fit of the model looks maybe worse in the tail than here, but this is just because of the logarithmic scale. If I switch to non-logarithmic scale, then you would say that this looks worse than that. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> But, but this is really a kind of a, this is only asking about the dispersal distances. But we are here interested in the much more detailed question of how does the structure of the landscape influence movements. Why are they all about not Oh, why they are not symmetrical? That, that's pretty much because this is logarithmic scale. So we, we were interested in the much more detailed question of how does the landscape structure influence movements. And actually here there was an applied question. This is an endangered species of butterfly in Finland. So the regional environmental center, they wanted to do some kind of restoration actions to improve the persistence of the butterfly. In this landscape B, we have like two subpopulations, the northern one and the southern one. And to avoid inbreeding depression, other things that increase the extinction risk of small populations, they wanted to build the corridor between these two populations. That was done for scientific reason or for...? This was done for as a management action, but then we combined research to that. It's, it's an endangered species of butterfly. <coughs> so what they did was to cut this kind of a corridor through the forest, which was basically creating semi-open habitat, which was one of the habitat types where we knew how the butterflies would move, based on data from landscape A. Okay, and they did a capture recapture study before the corridor was made and after the corridor was made in two consecutive years, so that we, we had data showing what's the influence of the corridor. And, and what we did was to try to predict with the model what, what the influence should be. And, and here we have the, the data before the corridor. These, these are the red dots. And then after the corridor was made, 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 they are the blue dots. And then these black dots with the error bars, they again show the model prediction. It now has a high amount of stochasticity because, you know, this is a really narrow corridor. It's kind of difficult to say certainly what the effect should be. But if we first focus on the right-hand side of the graph, so this shows the frequency of movements to the corridor area. So we are asking that what fraction of all the individuals that were captured in one of the, either in the northern or the southern population, ended up into the corridor area, okay? We see that before the corridor was made, it was basically forest, so it was very low in reality. But after the corridor was made, uh, quite a good number of butterflies moved to the corridor area, okay? And this is also what, what the model predicts, that there is a considerable increase. I mean, the, the quantitative match is not perfect, but the qualitative pattern is, is the same. So just based on this data that, you know, when they did the survey, they saw a lot of butterflies in the corridor. They, the conclusion at that stage was that the corridor was effective. Okay. But if you look at the data more carefully, if you ask that what fraction of the individuals actually moved between these two populations, the northern and the southern population, you see that in the real data, there is no difference. 
So not more butterflies moved from south to north or vice versa after the corridor was made. There is even a slight decrease, but I mean, basically it's the same. And what the model does is actually to do the same prediction. <coughs> I, I, I actually did the model prediction before I saw the empirical data. So I was kind of disappointed that, well, the model doesn't work because the biologist told me that, you know, the corridor was working very well. But then uh, when I look at the data, okay, it gave the same pattern. <coughs> so I think this was like really cool example of how the model predicted something novel that we didn't expect. Because this was a result that was counterintuitive to the biologist to start with. That how come, you know, the corridor was full of butterflies, but still it didn't increase functional connectivity. Okay, the model is making the same prediction, so we can now ask the model, why is this the case? There are no breathing opportunities in the corridor? What we are looking at here <coughs> is movements within one generation. Okay, so whether or not there are breeding opportunities in the corridor, they wouldn't influence this result because the life cycle is one year. In this case, there are no breeding opportunities in the corridor because the host plant is not there. There are nectar plants for adults, but not the host plant. The real data is capture Yeah, it's capture recapture data. So, we can use the model to ask that what kind of a corridor might increase movements, which is pretty much the same as asking like why this corridor didn't increase movements. So let's ask, phrase this question in terms of the geometry of the corridor. <coughs> so, think that you have two habitat patches, A and B, and you are interested in the movement probability that the individual which is born to patch A will ever visit patch B. And you look at this probability without a corridor, or then you connect them with a the corridor. And then you assume the parameters that we estimated for, for this species of butterfly. Okay? You can calculate these probabilities in this case even analytically. <coughs> you, and then you compare them, which one is higher. Okay? In this graph, I have plotted the, the ratio of these probabilities. So the red color in this graph means that movement probability P2 is greater than P1. Okay, so that the corridor e helps the butterfly to move from patch A to patch B. Whereas blue color says that it's the opposite situation. That this probability is actually higher than that. <coughs> and the graph is, is shown as a function of the geometry of the situation. So in the x-axis we have the size the basically the diameter of the habitat patch and in the y-axis <coughs> we have the distance between the habitat patches. Okay? If we look at the model parameters it's quite easy to see why we have this pattern. So what's happening is that if you don't have a corridor, if you only have patches surrounded by matrix, then the butterflies are very unlikely to leave the patches. So the emigration rate is low, but if they leave the patches there is nothing interesting for them. It's just some cultivated field or they are on top of a canopy of forest. So they are likely to fly very fast, okay? Which makes them quite likely to find the paths far away. If you connect these patches by a corridor, they are, the emigration probability is much higher. They are likely to go to the, paths, to the corridor area. But then there is so much interesting stuff for them in the, in the corridor. There are all these nectar plants that they move very slowly. So they are not likely to reach the other side of the corridor. So what we see here is that the corridor helps in this part of the graph, these short distances, and that's because then the butterflies have enough time to move to the other end of the corridor, if it's short enough. But it also helps in this part of the graph where the patches are very tiny. So if you have like tiny patches which are far away from each other, then the corridor will help. Let me say that in that situation, the absolute probability by which you ever move between these patches is very, very, very small. So maybe this is not very relevant, but it's saying that the corridor increases that tiny probability by some amount. And that's because <coughs> uh, without the corridor, when you are, you know, you, you start from this tiny patch, 
it's very very difficult to find this other tiny path far away because you are doing random walk in two dimensions. But if you connect them by a corridor, then you essentially you do random walk in one dimension, which is directing you directly to this path. That's why it, it helps in this place. This kind of geometries. And now the, the real... Hmm? But what, what explains this peak on the, on the large uh, patterns? Sorry? The peak of high, high uh, movement of P2. On the right side, on the bottom right side, there's a peak of movement. Okay, so, so, what, so what we show here is the ratio of these two probabilities. Okay, so we don't show the absolute probability of movement. Which is of course, you know, high in somewhere here. So that would be a different graph. But you are asking, saying, asking like why, why we have... Yeah, they are, they are very close and they are... Yeah. yeah why do you have this... Uh, minimum. There's like a minimum, minimum around 30. 30. Yeah. Well, I, I haven't thought about that in detail. I mean, what I explained is like why we have red here, why we have red here. But why we have uh, this minimum here, I haven't thought about that. But I mean, you can play with the model to figure out that what's creating that. How can the corridor decrease the? the yeah, we, I was also surprised about that. But you know, in many other pieces of research that I've done later, especially with butterflies, but also some other creatures, it's, it's actually often the case that barrier is a better functional corridor than a corridor. <laughs> that often, often you find that. Corridors, they decrease the movement, movement probability. And that's exactly because there is this trade-off between like habitat preference, like how likely you are to enter a habitat, and often you are likely to enter a corridor. Okay? But if the movement rate is low within the corridor, then it might be with these kind of short-living organisms. It might be you know, a real question that you don't just reach the other end before you die. That's why it can decrease it. So. So in often this kind of a corridor would <coughs> can be can be a good corridor that you know you have these two patches and then you have whatever cultivated field between these and, and then you just let's say that you would build a barrier like whatever uh, urban area like houses something that they wouldn't enter at all to this side and to this side okay then you still have this effect that when they are here they move fast because there is nothing too interesting but then they, they are kind of bouncing back. So, so they essentially do 1D diffusion. So if you predict this kind of probabilities, you often find that this kind of a corridor, which is really constructed of barriers, is most effective. I mean, also, I mean, could you simply, I mean, what is the size of the corridor? So if you are in a patch, and just think about your circle to the left there, and if it's a very narrow opening in the patch, yeah. then they really have to find the opening. Sure, sure. So it's a search process. So, so in this case, I was assuming that the corridor is equally wide as the path is. I mean, just to simplify. But <coughs> because this, this is somehow, you know, the case in this real example, where the real corridor that they constructed, it's, it kind of falls somewhere here, if you look at how long it is, and what were the sizes of the habitat path is. So that you, you see that just accidentally it happens to go to this plus minus zero region where it is not predicted to have any effect to either direction. But you, I mean, you are absolutely right that if you would assume that you have like, <coughs> like large patches, like let's say that, I mean, we have a study in, in Madagascar where <coughs> two national parks are kind of connected by a corridor. Let's say that this is 50, like a completely different scale. This is 50 kilometers. Well, the distance between these are I don't remember, maybe 100 kilometers. And then they are clearly connected by a much more narrow corridor than what's the size of these patches. What, what animal? Well, it's rainforest. I mean, you have all kinds of animals. What, what, this is not scale relevant to butterflies. No, 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 no. I mean, you, you might look at lemurs or, right. you know, chameleons or whatever. But like, <coughs> like in this, I, I'm just saying that there are corridors of very different type. What we are looking at here is a small scale corridor which is built to increase the movements of individuals within their lifetimes. Whereas this would be like a corridor where you can, you, you can actually have local populations. So you, have, you can have breeding, reproduction in the corridor. And then the processes are very different. So this is, it depends how comfortable is the corridor. 
by what you said here, it's like they just made the patches bigger, in a way. It's not a corridor anymore. If it's a good place, and they can stay there, and they can eat there, and they can... Yeah, that's right. I mean, I said that this literature on corridors is kind of a bit confusing, so that the same term is used for different things. Uh, like, I mean, I would still call this a corridor, even though now the habitat type might be the same here and here, because this is like a narrow, you know, long strip connecting these two big patches. So you, you could very well call this a corridor, but maybe it's not a movement corridor, okay, but it's a corridor which is connecting these two patches through population dynamic processes. Yeah. Uh, what's the time? So in total I still have like one and a half hours. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm lagging a bit behind the schedule because <coughs> there are a lot of questions which is absolutely a good thing because the idea is not that I just fast forward my talks and you don't understand anything. So keep on asking questions. It maybe takes uh, 10 minutes to finish this talk. Then we have a break and continue after that. Uh, I might speed up the latter part a little bit because this is not in the, in the core of this, this workshop. I just wanted to say that you can actually go on from movements to population dynamics. Because, you know, like in the butterfly example, we were interested not about the movements of the butterfly so much, but about the persistence of the butterfly. So what I show here is just an extension of the state space model for movement <coughs> to the full population dynamic cycle of the Planville free tillary butterfly. What you see here is a really complex detailed model. This is like the most detailed model we have ever done. I just show this to scare you a little bit. <coughs> we, have, we have done, of course, much more simple models, but we just wanted for fun to see what's the best model that we can develop for this butterfly for which you have so much data. So what we have here is smart recapture data. This is the movement model I was describing to you, like something like diffusion habitat selection here. Then we have here census data, autumn and spring counts of the butterfly, like in this Orland this Glanville free tillary metapopulation system, every year all these 4,000 habitat patches are checked twice to count the number of laval groups. So something like 40 students go there every year for a couple of weeks to, to visit all the places. And then there are some other data like control monitoring data, which is used to inform the observation probability, like what's the probability that the students go there, they don't see the laval nest, but they actually were there. And uh, what these errors show here is basically the life history of the butterfly. So they are flying around, the females are flying around, they are ovipositing eggs, eggs to the patches, they, they hatch as larvae, there is some environmental stochasticity that's hitting them, they might survive to the next year, then they, you know, grow, they, and eventually they eclose. As adult, adult butterflies, we actually ignore males in this model because males are not very interesting for uh, demographic dynamics. They emerge before the females and so the mating probability is very high. So ma males are more relevant if you think about genetic dynamics. And using these state-based models, you can even fit, you know, this kind of a very complex model to, to data. So what you get is like one model which gives you you know, describes the process from the individual level up to the entire metapopulation level. I'm just showing you kind of a simulation of... Can you go back one slide? These are all states, these are events, these are probabilities. Yeah, I, I, I'll explain. I mean, this, is, this graph is rather central. It's a... It's technically a... It's a DAG. This is a directly directed acyclic graph, which is a way to illustrate a state space model. I'll tell you this in detail using a simpler example than that. What you have here are the model parameters. These are the parameters. Uh, <coughs> then you have the states, like the hidden states, like how many larvae you had in a given patch in reality, okay, which you also need to estimate. And then these squares are fixed quantities, like, like data, or, or the sizes of the patches, things like that. 
Then you have these continuous arrows, they are stochastic links. Then you have dashed arrows, they are deterministic links. But I'll tell that in more detail in, in one of the lectures. Reminds a little bit of state charts. Oh. State charts? Probably, yeah. But I mean, th this is the standard way to, to draw a DAC, which is something that you always do with a state space model because it helps you to look at the model in a, to do the estimation. So if you look at, at the individual level, this is like one simulation. An individual was born to this patch, 23. Then it emigrated, I mean, it spent here, this is a continuous time model. It spent there like 1.9 days. Then it emigrated, it was moving in a matrix for a quarter of the day. Then it visited this habitat patch. It oviposited one egg group there, spent some time there, then left the patch again and then died in the matrix. So this is like, this is like life history of, of one butterfly. If you look at the population level, this is one of the networks in the, in the whole metapopulation, like a sub uh, network of the whole thing, where <coughs> the sizes of these circles, they are proportional to the sizes of the habitat patches, but they are in this graph, they are much bigger than in reality, because if I wouldn't scale them up, you would only see like small dots. Uh, if you look at this habitat patch, see what happens over time. This is a thousand year long simulation showing how many larval groups you had in that patch any given year. You see this kind of a high variation, which is because environmental stochasticity is really important for these kind of creatures. If I take this patch here, which is a tiny isolated patch, I see that in this simulation, I mean, which is based on all the data that we collected for the species, based on the parameter estimates from the data, we see that in this habitat patch, it's, it's almost always empty. Only, you know, some occasional years you have one or two or three uh, <coughs> larval groups and then it goes extinct again. It's simply too small to isolate it, which is something that we see in the real data as well. What does, it, does density has effect on the uh, breeding uh, uh, capacity in the model? Like in a dense pass, uh, would you be able to have less uh, surviving offspring? Yeah, there is carrying capacity in the model, but actually, these kind of systems, they are really dominated by environmental stochasticity. So carry capacity plays a role really seldom. It's only in, in the real peak years. But you have to have that, otherwise you have exponential growth. Or you can look at the simulation at the metapopulation level. <coughs> so this is the whole Poland Islands, where each dot is not, now not a habitat patch, but one network of habitat patches. Okay? And in these simulations, I saw what is the fraction of habitat patches within that network that's occupied at any given year. Uh, this is one, if you look at like this focal network here, which is kind of a high quality network, we see that <coughs> typically something like half of the patches are occupied. But if we take this network here, where you have, you know, only a couple of patches which are not very big and which are far away from each other, we see that it's, it's often extinct at the network level. So this is like a stochastic version of the extinction threshold. Okay, then you can construct these demographic dynamics with data. Here are the thick lines, they show like real data from <coughs> one of the networks then these individual uh, gray lines, they show like simulations from the model showing that there is huge amount of stochasticity. I mean, basically environmental stochasticity, that even <coughs> that there is a lot of stochasticity in the prediction. So here we have a prediction for how many larval groups we see in the, in the system. What's the probability that any of the patches goes extinct? You see that there is high turnover. Extinction rate is something like 0.3. Uh, what is the colonization probability and what is the occupancy probability of a given patch? What's the single nucleotide? Well, that's, I mean, this is just a reference from, from which you can find these graphs, but in that paper we went on from demographic dynamics to, to genetic dynamics. Okay? So you can, 
use the model to predict patterns of, let's say, to start with neutral genetic dynamics. You can, you can add to these butterflies in the model also genes and you can track how the genes are spreading in the landscape. You can calculate things like FST. If you don't know what is an FST, I mean, I'm not, there's no time to go deeply in this, but it's a measure of genetic differenci differentiation, that if you take individuals from two populations, how different they are genetically, okay? So this is the empirical result from the network, and this is what the model predicts. So you see that it, it's a pretty good match. It, it is actually a very good match because we used these data also to parameterize the model. Okay, so that's why it's a good match. So we, we kind of used all the demographic data and all this neutral data to, to parameterize the model. But then this is an <coughs> independent prediction that we then did with the model. So this is a non-neutral gene, which is this PGI. It relates to the movement rate of the butterfly. But there's no time to talk about this now in great detail, but I'll tell a little bit in the very last lecture. Basically, if the individuals have, have this allele C in that gene, uh, they are more dispersive than individuals which don't have that. And what we saw from the empirical data is that the frequency of this allele C is higher in those networks where the population is, is, is rare, where you have only a couple of larval groups. Actually, what you see is that in those networks there's high amount of variation. You either have a high fraction of this allele or then uh, it's, it's not there at all. There's more stochasticity here than there. And, and one reason for this pattern is that uh, these are typically like the new populations that were just established. Okay, so it has to be a dispersive female to get there and then it was likely to have this allele C. And th this, is, this is pretty much also what the model is predicting. So now we didn't use these data to, to fit the parameters. This is just an independent prediction to be made to kind of validate the model. Okay, I'm finally done in uh, almost two hours through this 45 minute talk. <coughs> so the conclusions that I want to make at this stage are that first of all, quantitative modeling of animal movement in heterogeneous space is quite challenging. This approach that I showed, this diffusion model in heterogeneous space with habitat selection, I mean, it's a pretty simple mathematical model, but it's still quite challenging technical task to, to fit those kind of models to data in practice. State-based models combine a process model with an observation model, and they allow one to bring biological in knowledge into statistical inference. For example, the parameterize dynamic models of movement and use data with missing observations. <coughs> and movement models can be integrated into models of demographic, genetic, and evolutionary dynamics. And I think it's really the bringing different kinds of data together, what, what is you know, helping us to, to get a more full picture of what's, what's happening in, in reality. Okay, let's have now a like 15 minute break, so we continue about half past 10. Thank you. Thank you.